Welcome to the Equinity Podcast, where horse owners just like you share their incredible Equinity stories and how Equinity is changing their horses' lives. Whether you're searching for something to give your performance horse better focus, faster recovery, and more stamina, or in the extreme case where all hope seems lost, give your horse what it needs to help heal at a cellular level, you'll find it here. So jump in on today's episode to hear how Equinity is helping horses worldwide. Now, welcome your host, John Dowdy. Hello and welcome to another Equinity podcast. I am so excited for this podcast this week. Uh, We've been trying to coordinate this for quite a few months now. Um, And before we jump into it, if this is your first time listening in on our podcast, and maybe this is the first time you've heard about the Equinity product, I'm going to give you a quick uh, background on what it is, and then we'll get into our guest today. Um, so this product actually started back in 1998 as a anti-aging youth formula for the 50-plus crowd. And Dr. Philip White, who's British, Cambridge and Harvard-educated, family physician, and head of the hospital for 35-plus years in Canada, was able to figure out the combination of amino acids um, to stimulate the pituitary gland, which then releases the necessary hormones, which help heal the body at a cellular level. So that was 1998. Um, we skipped forward to 2014, and we put the same formula in a tub and called it Equinity so we could market it to the horse industry. So, you know, if you're looking around on Facebook and hearing people talk about it, it's quite an amazing product. We are definitely blessed. And the reason I'm so excited today is our guest today, Dr. Charlene Beluzzo out of California. I'm going to give you a, uh, a an intro here, so grab a cup of coffee because yeah, it's it's a long intro, but that's okay because uh, it, it, this is so exciting. All right, here we go. So Dr. Charlene, internationally recognized as a global health expert in both business and nonprofit sectors. She has expertise in population wellness, medical research, regulatory affairs, strategic planning, marketing, and operational management, just to name a few. Her professional passion has been to promote human health and wellness, strengthen communities, generate economic prosperity, and enrich the lives of the world's most vulnerable. She holds doctorate degrees of public health and tropical medicine and preventative health, holds a master's degree of business administration, and completed postgraduate training and a medical fellowship in HIV AIDS research, managing international clinical trials, and authoring new drug applications for regulatory drug approval. And to fill in the extra time in her life, and one of the main reasons why we have her on the call today is because she has an equine therapy nonprofit that does amazing work with, among other things, trauma victims. And when she first learned about the Equinity product around 2015 time frame and saw the amino acids, she knew exactly what Dr. White was doing with this and how it was going to help the body. So without further ado, Dr. Sherilyn Beluzzo, welcome to the Equinity Podcast. I am delighted to be here. Thank you so much for the invitation. Well, we are happy to have you, and I know there's been a lot of questions come in, and so we're just going to pick your brain, uh, if that's okay with you. Fabulous. Let's get started. (laughs) So uh, we're talking about amino acids, and we're going to get into a bit of the science. Uh, There seems to be a lot of uh, education that... that, uh, I guess would need to happen with a lot of people out there. They're just not familiar with amino acids, and I thought this would be a, a great way to uh, help them get educated. We've got a lot, of, a lot of educational things on our website, but there's uh, no better substitute than to have somebody that really understands uh, from a medical standpoint. And although your background is, uh, you know, been more on the human side, um, I think as we get through this, people understand how it can translate right over in into the horse world. So uh, one of the things that we were talking about, um, you know, what, what's your take on the the physiology uh, physiology standpoint uh, with how complicated humans and horses are and the evolution of all of this? You know, what's your take on all that? This is really an important foundational conversation for this discussion today because the world, as all of you have experienced, has accelerated at a rate that is astronomical, that technologies and our lifestyle and just the way that we live has so accelerated to the point 
that lots of us are feeling the changes physiologically and emotionally, those very same things are happening to our horses. And one thing that to remember is humans and horses and most mammal creatures evolve very, very slowly. It would take centuries of time for us to physiologically be able to catch up with the demands and the, the lifestyles that we've created for ourselves and for our horses. So what I want to emphasize is health is really your cells at the molecular level in perfect balance. So what we're going to talk about a lot today is how do we in this world of massive change and the way that we go about uh, our own lives as well as the way that we engage with our horses, how can we help through our nutrition and through our habits to help our bodies at, at a cellular level, at that molecular level, be in better balance? You know, you think about how a horse started in, in early times of, of history and they traveled in herds, they spent days with their heads down, grazing small bites throughout the entire day. They had spaces that when they were stimulated to do so, that they could take off and run without enclosures and that they could move as a herd and they could work out their own dynamics. Out of love and out of necessity, we've brought horses into a realm that is much, much different than it was designed to be. We're keeping our horses in, in contained areas. We feed them in a different way quite often. There are very few horses that get to live engaged with humans in the lifestyle in which they were designed. And so the, the best thing that we can do out of love and for and necessity to have horses in our lives is help to balance their nutrition and their lifestyles by giving them what might give them the most optimal health. And I think that one thing to, to consider is it's not just what we feed them, but it's how we're feeding them. And oftentimes in, in the situations that our horses must be in, they get fed twice or maybe three times a day, a larger quantity. They're not designed necessarily to be that. So what can we do from a nutritional basis to help their systems balance as if they had those supplies of nutrients throughout the day? And so those are some of the things we're going to talk about a little later in this talk, ways that we can care for ourselves and for our horses in the light of change knowing that physiologically we can't evolve quick enough to keep up with the demands that contemporary life has put on us. Yeah, and that makes uh, perfect sense. And, you know, <clears throat> although the, the topic of full nutrition um, is a whole topic in and of itself, um, we're going to narrow this down just to the importance of what we're talking about with equinity, and that's amino acids, um, which we have found to be so powerful. Uh, now being on the market in the equine industry for a little over four years, it just, you know, hearing people every single day, and it doesn't matter what part of the country they're in uh, or what caliber per se of, of horse, whether it's at a high-end dressage jumping barn or a rescue horse or a pasture ornament, the, this particular stack of amino acids, it seems to help all of them, um, which we have concluded. That, I mean, horses in general seem to be deficient in the right amount of amino acids. So what is your, what's your take on that? May I give you just a, a slight uh, primer on amino acids themselves. I, I know this is on your website, but amino acids are the building blocks of protein, but those proteins are found in plants, animals, and people. So amino acids in themselves are a very basic element that has been around since the beginning of, of animals and man and, and most creatures. And what they do 
mainly for us that is the most important and also for our animal friends and particularly our horses in this conversation is they maintain muscle mass. And an example of maintaining muscle mass is the proteins make up um, all muscle in our body, including uh, our organs, and a lot of the connective tissue is protein. Um, amino acids are, as the building block of proteins, regulate blood sugar. Uh, they aid in energy improvement. They heal wounds. They're for repairing tissue, uh, for memory and concentration, stress alleviation, and like I, I said, they're, they're that element that helps the cells to function at the greatest level, being able to metabolize energy and to remove waste. And so that's why amino acids really are key to so many functions of our body when we're trying to maintain health, recovery from exertion or, or stress, or just stay young. We want to stay as young as we can for as long as we can and as healthy as we can. We want our horses to do the same. We want them to, to feel youthful and be able to perform at their peak and have a fulfilling full life just like we do. And those types of things are, are aided by the presence of the right amino acids. Right. Now, when, uh, as you just mentioned, amino acids are the building blocks of protein, you know, what, and some of the questions that we have that come in, you know, hey, I'm already feeding a high protein diet, you know, so why do I need this particular amino acids in a quinity? Uh, what would you have to say about that, you know, proteins versus amino acids? So going back to the physiology of how we, we utilize and metabolize a protein diet is quite a bit different from the way that the supplement of Aquinity's um, amino acids are actually formulated. So, and it has to do with, with digestion and, me, and the met, metabolic process. So eating a protein is a slow metabolic process. Uh, when you eat a protein, it goes into to your gut. It starts to break down. It starts to become available for the nutrients to be absorbed, but it takes time to break down. A protein is, is something very complex to break down. Uh, when you're eating protein, be it plant protein in the horse's case, um, it will begin digestion in the stomach, but it really starts, the digestion process to become bioavailable to enter the bloodstream more in the intestine. And by the time it goes through all the loops of, of intestine, both in humans and horses, it is about to the end of the end of the small intestine before the uh, digestion has occurred to the point of going into the, the larger bowel and and at that point becoming more compact and, and ready to eliminate. So when you're talking about equinity, the eight amino acids that were specifically selected that trigger or ignite the, the process that we are seeking to, to benefit for the horses, um, that occurs in the stomach and becomes bioavailable right away into the bloodstream because the molecule itself is crystalline and is very small. And it allows that absorption to happen very quickly and get into the bloodstream and make its way up to the brain and where it engages in the pituitary gland. And I think John, maybe we'll talk about the pituitary gland in a minute because that's a very important thing. Right. And that's, and so when you're feeding your horse proteins, that's great because they will get the benefit of those proteins breaking down and getting eventually into the bloodstream. But this is a fast track on particular targeted stack of amino acids that have a particular function that have been designed to give us the outcomes, uh, the effect on the pituitary, and thus uh, 
the effects in the body that that we want for recovery and for uh, muscle development and for uh, easing uh, stress on nerves, uh, those types of things that that John has d- described. That's why it's great to have a high protein diet, but it is also very beneficial to have the supplement due to where the absorption takes place. Yeah, so with the the combination of the crystallized amino acids and the equinity, you're getting super fast absorption so it can go right to work versus the protein. It just takes a lot of time. And I would, not having a metal, medical background myself, um, with protein, I'm sure some of that's going to pass through the body because it's maybe not going to break, break all of it down. And that depends on, on the animal or the human system itself how well they are able to metabolize protein. And so protein is essential in your diet. And I'm not saying that equinity would would replace a protein diet in any way. Mm -hmm. And if uh, your vet has recommended that a high-protein diet would be effective and be useful for this particular horse's condition, then that's fabulous and something you really need to follow. And it is not contradictory to taking equinity because in the bioavailability you're not going to be competing and so there is a benefit to both they're not in conflict right and so that's um i'll go ahead and ask you this question i had this one saved but since we kind of brought that up is there any um going to have any negative side effects with any other medications or supplements or feeds or anything by giving equinity So first of all, let's talk about just the effects of amino acids themselves. The side effects of amino acids are almost none. And I say almost because where you would risk having side effect with amino acids is in overdosing, providing uh, a load that your body cannot manage effectively in its elimination processes. And like we're saying, um, the dietary protein will not be in conflict with the equinity dosing because they metabolize in a different way and actually in a different area of the gut and hit the bloodstream at much different times. So that's not the concern. Um, The concern would be more if you were overdosing to the point that the body's mechanisms couldn't regulate it, then... You, there is a risk of some fatigue or loss of coordination, but I would be completely shocked if anyone would ever get to the point of, of an overdose with equinity that would have any effect at all because no one is going to give their horse that high of a, of a dosage. I, so I don't, and it's not in conflict with the protein that they're eating. Sure. Um, did that answer the question, John? I'm not exactly sure if I fully yep. answered what you were thinking. No, that's perfectly fine because I, I guess if uh, somebody had left the tub or dumped the, the entire tub in the bucket, that could be an overdose. Or how that how your body tries to regulate the type of amino acid presence that equinity would be is when we were talking about going into the bloodstream and when it when it then hits the pituitary, there is a signal. Uh, when the when the pituitary signals the hippocampus to release the hormones and the the GH the growth hormone particularly but a number of other hormones that are incredibly important to cellular balance um, there will be a shut off when the amount is adequate in the body the body has that type of regulators if you're so overdosed that it's it's leaking, if you will, if it's uh, too much for that shutoff me- mechanism to hold, you could experience such a thing. But I would see that effect because of the way that proteins are metabolized. They're going to be gone in 23 to, or 24 hours. If you see an overdose situation go through a, a full day, then you'll know it's pretty much out of their system because that's the, the, the half-life that's the scientific word for how quickly we rid any 
substance from our body in a natural way, um, that that 24 hours would be the only time you should be worrying. You won't need to worry about it a week later or or even a, a, a couple of days later. It will be pretty much gone by that time. Right. So with the serving size of a quinity, which is 5.2 grams, not quite a tablespoon, um, you know, Dr. White was able to figure out that that is the optimal dosage to stimulate the pituitary ultimately. Um, and when you're talking specifically about overdosing, you know, we have a lot of um, uh, performance horses uh, that, that use this product. Uh, they swear by two scoops a day. That's one in the morning, one in the evening. We've also found that injured horses or ones that are coming out of a surgery uh, doing two scoops, one in the AM and one in the PM, they seem to really um, uh, help the recovery process. Um, so w that wouldn't technically be overdosing. And, you know, overdosing would be like giving three, four, five scoops at a time. Or it, So just to clarify that, what's your take on that? So when you're, I, I think that's an incredibly important point about you being in touch and in tune with your horses. So with that, you want to, to give the, the nutrients and the support that could be needed in the time, depending on how the performance of the horse, the demands that are on the, on the horse. And so two scoops, particularly split dosing, doing a morning and a night dose, putting a recovery time uh, for the, the body's mechanisms to work is, is ideal. You're making enough amino acids of the proper type available to the system, and you're in tune enough to know, to notice, is this having a positive effect? I think what you're saying is from the testimonials you're receiving that this, that under conditions of extreme performance or or stress or health or weather or whatever may be affecting that if we are in tune and we're paying attention we're making the proper nutrients and enough amino acids available and we're knowing that that's having a positive effect and no more is needed and no negative effect is occurring i think that's one of the beautiful things about the relationship we have in the horse human partnership that connection we have that we can't speak in words to our horses but that we can be in tune with their health with their needs we can see from their coat from their eyes from the way they move from the quality of their hooves their hair they just you can tell if you're optimally caring for them and giving what they need under the conditions that are demanded of them. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really a lovely heartfelt thing that people are finding that they are able to optimally dose and what works best to keep their horse fit and performing and happy and well. Right. I yeah. love to hear stories like that because it does take that type of connection to fine tune help like that that fine balance of what really works for the specific situation you're in. No, absolutely. And uh, as we get um, a little further in into this podcast, um, I'd love to go more in depth with that about your um, rehabilitation form and how you use horses to help with trauma victims and how it, it actually helps both the horse and the people. So that, that'll be a neat part of the, the conversation. Um, well, I'd love... I'd, Love to talk about that. So thank you for including it. Oh, absolutely. So one of the questions that we have uh, that come in is, hey, my horse is dealing with this particular issue, whatever it might be. Um, you know, it could be they need a top line filled in or they've got some allergies or their hooves are absolutely horrible or they've got laminitis or white line or thrush or navicular or ring bone or some gut issues or they're stressed with all of these different things going on. Um, and I know with the things that you've talked about so far, how can one little tiny scoop, 5.2 grams, given that daily, how can it have such a tremendous impact on all of these different scenarios with the horse? 
that is like the simplest question of science to answer because the most basic laws of physics and physiology is elements seek perfect balance. They seek equilibrium. And so when you think about how, what, at what level could we affect all of those things you mentioned, you do have to go down to the molecular unit and how that molecular balance in the cell is in equilibrium. And the way to do that is three things. The first one is getting elements into the cell that can have the mechanism of action to produce the energy to, to provide uh, really the fuel to, to, for the body to, to run optimally. So amino acids have a huge role in that. They, they work in the mitochondria to help um, metabolize the glucose coming in and, and balancing that, and then the byproducts taking them out of the cell. So we didn't talk much about glucose, but that is a very important role of amino acids, as well as regu regulating the hormone, uh, growth, human growth hormone. It, I should say growth hormone, not human. Um, it also helps to regulate glucose and keep that sugar level low, which minimizes inflammation. And inflammation causes the aging of cells. So if you are keeping a cell highly functioning, producing a high level of energy, removing the toxins, keeping the blood sugar level circulating in the blood, and that's important because we, we do feed horses unless they're out grazing all day. They eat once in the morning, maybe once midday, and once at night, and in that they keeping their blood sugar level is really important. So I hope that, that this makes sense, that if you're really wanting to fine-tune health, minimize inflammation, um, the antioxidant property of amino acids can really help keep cells in their, their youth or their peak performance across the board. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, it's, it's simple that the body wants to work with you and fine tuning that helps. If you think about building, if you were, if you were a sculptor and you were going to make a, a sculpture out of a big piece of stone, you could not necessarily, Rodin could not create the thinker totally with a jackhammer. He could take off the big pieces of stone with a jackhammer, but what needed to be fine tuned to make that beautiful piece of art is small balancing, a very small instrument that takes, that fine tunes the beauty of the art. And that's what we're doing is with the amino acids, our hope is to fine tune health at the smallest level, which, which impacts all aspects of health. It, it influences the aspect of health if you're old, if you're young, if you're big, if you're small. So that's why I think it's so important that equinity is, can be used through the life cycle of a horse because balance is important every day right. of the horse's life. Now, with the example that you just gave, so uh, the jackhammer, or in this case, we could say giving the horse a scoop of equinity could be equivalent to uh, the jackhammer in this example, because <laughs> um, then ultimately we've got to fine tune from a molecular level. So we're stimulating the pituitary gland or the amino acids uh, are rapidly absorbed through the bloodstream, stimulate the pituitary. So let's get into a little bit, um, and we kind of did this a, a little backwards, but let's talk about the role and the function of the pituitary gland, How what these amino acids, when we give it to the horse, now it stimulates the pituitary and then what happens now? Okay. So the pituitary gland is sometimes called the master gland. And it's the perfect name for such a teeny tiny thing. Um, the pituitary 
It is about the size of a pea, and it sits at the base of your brain behind the sinuses, about the level of the bridge of your nose. And when um, the amino acids have passed through the blood-brain barrier, which Aquinity has been formulated that the, to be small enough to make such an entry, then it ignites or gives a communication to the hippocampus that, that releases particular hormones that then start traveling throughout the body to do, to do their job, to, to signal releases of certain other elements in body function. So the pituitary really is the one that, that has an effect on most all body functions. And so that's when we're stimulating the proper and healthful release of HG and other hormones that promote health, then that's the way that, that from a very central control booth or a central master mind, the master gland, then that signal can be taken by a whole army of, of different mechanisms that throughout the body to maintain health. And then, and it's also in certain time frames that that first the first release of hormone then also gets replaced and triggers other releases. So it's a cascading effect that can last throughout the day. Right. So this is the being able to get to the pituitary is the fine tuning at the molecular level. Now, what Dr. White was able to figure out back in 1998 uh, by triggering this on the human side, and when we came into the horse industry, uh, and you kind of made mention of this, but the pituitary about the size of a pea, and that's pretty close in, in mammals across the board? It is, ironically. And, and isn't that interesting because it's one of all the, those glands, too, that doesn't grow a lot of size from, from when you're a baby to you're an adult. So that's an interesting uh, thing about the pituitary. It does say to name to its importance. Um, in the evolution of people and all, all animals, really, um, those crucial uh, centers, if you will, in the body are pretty well developed when you take your first breath or you or begin begin functioning in the outside world, outside of the womb. And so that's something that I think is really uh, amazing that the, any horse of any size or age or uh, breed, the basic dose of one scoop is in relationship to the size of the pituitary is a good place to start. Like we talked about that you might increase to two scoops for performance or, or under stressful conditions. But with the one scoop, that, that makes uh, it's the right dosing in relationship to the size of the pituitary. Right. That is very interesting. So one of the other questions that we get uh, often are, you know, there's something going on with my horse um, do I just need to keep the Aquinity product on my horse to, to quote, fix the issue, and then can I stop, or should I keep it on the product long-term? And is there any long-term pros and cons uh, with keeping them on product? There is definitely a long-term pro. You're wanting to keep your horse on a cellular, molecular balance and even highly functioning level their entire lifetime. So I think you're saying like during the off season, if you will, when horses are, are, unless you, if I was a polo player for years and years, and in, in my case, I didn't trailer my horses to the desert and play all winter. Uh, my polo horses really pretty much had the winter off, but their health was cri critically important to me that, for two reasons, that you can't expect an a animal or a human 
to go out in peak performance after they've taken a break or after uh, they've been had an illness or been out off the field for a while um, if they haven't regained their fitness. So wouldn't it be easier to keep the athlete or keep the horse or keep the human fit, keep them nutritionally fit as well as keeping their movement and, and keeping their body rather than to have to try to recover it later? Or wouldn't it be better to help keep a horse or a human healthy in a preventative health type of way that keep their immune system strong, keep their muscles strong, being able to keep them healthy for the long term rather than to, to have to try to improve health when it gets out of balance. I know for me with 10 horses, the vet bills could be astronomical if I didn't have healthy, well-balanced horses. So it's important to me that they are balanced and that they are healthy and that they do have a common baseline. And I know my, me personally, my vet bills have dramatically reduced and the general health of my horses, um, a colic on my farm would be a, a rare thing. It really doesn't happen much anymore. Extreme changes in temperature sometimes happen in California. We have, right now we're experiencing a difference of 40 degrees from night to day. Mm. Those types of, of swings in temperature really have an impact on the balance of the horses and, and the risk for colic. So I am adamant that they get their equinity every single day, every single horse. If it's the minis or the drafts, the big... Uh, nearly 2,000 pound horses. It's important to all of them to, to have that balance. In the long run, I think I save a lot of money and it just makes us all happy to see healthy, strong horses. Yeah, and I think that's uh, very common. People are uh, definitely saving a significant amount of uh, money since they started using the, the product, um, the equinity product. Their horses are healthier, happier. So that's great. And we've also found, just to touch on what you were talking about, uh, keeping your horses on, uh, you know, 365, um, as, especially a lot of people up north that kind of hang their horses up for the winter. Uh, we found that those that keep their horses on product, um, they're back in shape in two, three, sometimes four weeks ahead of schedule from years past when they didn't have the equinity or didn't know it was available so they they're back in shape a lot faster. Their hooves look great. Uh, they hold, help hold their weight. So it all makes sense um, to what you're saying for sure. I guess and I really want to emphasize. I'm basing what I'm saying. I'm not a veterinarian. I'm not an animal research expert. All of my research and my entire career has been in human health. First and foremost, always follow your veterinary your veterinary advisement. If the veterinarian uh, your equine horse specialist that you trust and that you employ has instructed you, that's the first uh, directive to follow. They have much more history of the horse. They have the background. They have lab tests. They have physical examination to back up what they're saying. So first and foremost, follow your veterinary advisement. But I have lived with and cared for horses my entire life. And they're so deeply important to me. And so I look at their health from the scientific perspective because in some ways, physiology is physiology. And, and the way that horses function in this particular manner, in the pituitary manner, is very similar to humans. And that's why it just makes sense to me from a scientific perspective that the science I've known all my career, applying it to this particular situation is legitimate. It makes sense. Yeah, a absolutely. And I tell you, um, it's been fun for me over the last, uh, well, since we've been on the market and we've been out at different events. And, you know, in the beginning, there were a lot of questions because we were new to the market. And I would always 
know there was something up when somebody would go more in depth with the questioning. I'm like, okay, this isn't your average person just asking questions. And then after I answered all the questions the best way I knew from a scientific level, then they would tell me, oh, well, I'm a vet. <laughs> and I go, of course, I passed all their questioning tests, so that was good. But as you say, this goes back to the simplistic thing of science and what the amino acids are doing in the body at a cellular level, whether it be on the people side or the horse side. I mean, it's primarily all works the same once you get in, in there from a pituitary standpoint. And this science has been defined in the literature since the 1920s. It's amino acid effect on pituitary is not new science. It's almost been a hundred years. That's incredible. That it's been documented in the, in the scientific literature. And so I think that, that the, the basis of, of how the mechanisms work is quite standard. I believe that it's brilliant how Dr. White isolated which of the eight amino acids, the eight amino acids that he did select to go in equinity, their qualities and their characteristics how they affect the pituitary and which hormones do they stimulate for what purposes. That type of science really has a brilliance that I'm impressed with and that I fully agree with the theories that the product was based on, I, I think was very, very well thought and, and based in a lot of, of acceptable science. And that's why I, I'm an endorser. Is I, I believe that I can can put my reputation on it as well. So, well, I tell you what, Dr. Charlene, this is really valuable information. I can't thank you enough for sharing from a scientific standpoint. I know it's going to be very, very helpful for a lot of those that are kind of tuning in for the first time and learning really the importance of amino acids and what it has for their horse Um so, you know, we're seeing it on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's being exposed to new people all the time. So I think this is going to be a, a very, very valuable um, podcast for the information. So thank you so much for your scientific expertise. Is it, are you getting what you hope? Are you getting pieces that you wanted? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure uh, down the road we can do a, do a follow-up. Um, so thank you so much for all of that. And as I mentioned in your intro, um, I also uh, had mentioned that in your spare time, you also have an equine therapy. Um, so the name of your farm is Belos Cavallos. Tell us what that means and tell us all about your equine therapy and your, your farm there. Great. Thank you so much for asking because this truly is my heart work. Um, in global health, um, I work in malaria and other tropical diseases all over the world. And when I was working with refugees with the United Nations, um, we were taught a particular model of trauma recovery, which is an experiential model. It's when tragedy and trauma are so bad that there are not words to discuss or explain what has been experienced. Oftentimes language barriers are an issue. And so being able to address trauma from the inside out through experiences, through nature, through physical activity, through food, through music, through dance, through drumming, those types of things are a way to resolve trauma. And when I, I did uh, leave the UN refugee work and came back to California, I was asked to do that type of, of trauma recovery work um, at my farm. And the natural thing to do was to incorporate the horses into the work because the horses become the most amazing facilitators. Their sensitivity is so keen that horses by nature are designed as prey animals thus meaning their senses are so much more heightened than ours. Their life depends on being able to use sight, sound, smell, touch, taste to keep alive and to thrive. 
And in that way, it makes them incredible commu nonverbal communicators and heart-to-heart -heart connectors. So right away, I found with those who had survived severe trauma were particularly open and available to nature and to the horses, animals in general, and just experiencing something without having to talk about it. And thus we created a curriculum that included resilience, self-regulation, empathy, and elements of hope through particular activities and engagements that people who have survived trauma, particularly children, could really accelerate their recovery and begin to open up and work through their trauma through an experiential way. The horse is so engaged with particularly the children that we only really needed to hold a, a safe space for these types of engagements to occur, that the horses really have the ability to take these people through a lot of, a lot of their trauma um, awareness and to get in touch with it and get back into their bodies and to be able to start to breathe again with some ease. We do breathing with the horses. We do yoga with the horses, a lot of walking and hiking, things like grooming to, for people to be able to touch and feel the softness of a horse's nose and the roughness of their hooves. Those types of things help them get grounded again and get familiar with them with themselves again. It's a very powerful tool. Um, the farm is called Terra de Bellos Cavallos, which means land of beautiful horses. My charity is called Bellos Cavallos, uh, meaning beautiful horses, just because the herd and the horses themselves create that type of metaphor for what we're trying to do, that the horse-human herd, when you can engage together, is a very healing opportunity when protected. And I would very much love to share a gr at a greater length the philosophy of the horse-human connection and, and its impact on trauma recovery. It's something that, that has really become my heart's work. In fact, this coming week, I'm going to be uh, training uh, in mind-body medicine and being able to introduce our equine work into a group of, of physicians from across the country that are all going to be gathering together to study on, on how to integrate mind-body medicine more into our practice of human health care. And I'm thrilled to be able to bring the, the history and, and the theory of the horse and the herd dynamic to that work. I think that it's, it's not just a trend or it's not just, just a fad that's coming in and out. I think that it is a way for, for humans at large to, to become more engaged in this world of, of so much technology and connectivity uh, to get down to earth again and to be able to take the aspects and the characteristics of a horse and apply them to our own wellness might be something that goes far beyond just uh, the programs I do in trauma recovery here at my farm. Sure. Now, maybe for some of those who aren't familiar with how this type of thing works, therapy, horses, and how beneficial that is, um, could you give an, um, an example, maybe somebody that has never been around a horse and they might just be terrified of horses? What, what's been like their experience when they come out to the farm and how do you connect or how does the horse connect with somebody that might be fearful because they, they've just never been around a horse before. What's that experience like? That is described almost everyone that has gone, has survived a severe trauma. I say it's very few of them that have ever been around a horse or touched a horse. 
And so that in, in itself is a huge gain for someone to feel the confidence to engage and relate to a very, very large animal that they've never had contact with. So it starts rather slowly and it starts, we do most of the work that we do at Liberty, meaning that you don't have a halter or line and it's all in relationship. Um, I need to bring equinity back into the conversation because I have to say the horses that participate in this work, they have to be healthy and confident to engage in the work so that they can be at their best. And so that's one thing that, that's why equinity has been so important to me is, is when horses are at their best, they're able to engage in this, this work well. And uh, the one example that I, I would love to tell you, we work with a great number of youth that are either incarcerated or they've been removed from their living situation by, the law, by law enforcement or the court. So they don't live in, they live in a, an institution or a mm -hmm. group setting. Um, those children, because of the trauma they've been through, they sometimes disassociate and they're not fully in their body. What they've experienced is gets, numbs them. Right. And they, they are not feeling all of their senses. So we have, uh, walking with a horse, one day uh, a young man who was extra sensitive to any sound or or sudden movement, he had his his fear alarm was set on high volume. I mean, he was really jumpy, and so he's walking along with one of our mares, Shalena, who has had numerous foals, and she's just a gentle, gentle soul, and. Something banged across the farm. Maybe the tractor dropped something or something happened. And she's slightly startled. And this boy nearly jumped out of his skin. And um, he looked at me in complete terror. And I said, what just happened? And he said, I heard a noise and Shalena jumped. And I said, and then what happened? So he told me the story of what happened. And then I said, and what was happening in you? And he said, he said, my hands got all sweaty and my heart beat, beat fast and I thought I was going to cry. And I said, so, and what did Shalena do? And she goes, well, Shalena kind of jumped, but then she just thought, oh, it's just the tractor. It's no big deal. Hmm. And she just stood by me. And then I said, so why don't we... Stand with, I said, does Shalena seem calm to you? And he said, yes, Shalena is calm. And I said, then put your hand on Shalena's side. And let's just breathe with Shalena. Feel her breathe. Feel her hair. Feel her warmth. Feel her breathe. And let's match her breathing until you feel calm. And so he did, and he did, and, he, and until he was done, it, as long as it took. And when he was done, he says, I feel calm. <laughs> and so I said, well, then let's, so I said, well, let's walk on. And we dropped it. And then that's all the processing that was needed. He was able to recognize his fear, assess it, what's going on around him, he was able to look inside. What effect did that have on me? What's happening to my heart? What's happening? Am I sweating? How am I breathing? He was able to reach out for something of stability. Shalena was the stable thing. He was able to physically connect with her, put his hand on her fur, feel her warmth, feel her breathe. And then in a breathing self-regulation, because her breathing was slow and relaxed, he matched that slow and relaxed breathing, and he was able to regulate himself and feel in relationship. Wow. And all without medications. And he, yes. And, and then we let it be. We didn't over-talk it. We didn't analyze, sit down on a couch and analyze it. We just let that experience be. But later on, I heard when he got back to the children's center, 
he told one of the staff what happened, and he said, he told the story, and then he said, and I love Shalena. <laughs> and I thought, well, so he was able to express love. Yeah. And sometimes it's hard for these kids to receive love and express it because it can be dangerous. Right. And it allowed, it allowed him to actually express love knowing that rejection wouldn't follow that. It was really a powerful experience. And yes, no medicine, no, um, it wasn't a long session. It wasn't, it wasn't long. And it was just part of, it was just part of the activity. Sure, sure. Now, uh, do you have any experience with um, military, you know, with dealing with PTSD? Not that it can't be in chi- children as well, PTSD, but as far as military goes? So here at my farm, we have not, but I would love to. There are two groups. One are our military veterans, and the second are first responders, Uh, the EMTs, ambulance drivers, firemen, policemen. We have done uh, workshops and and, uh, facilitated uh, sessions with first responders. We even have a program called LEO, Law Enforcement Officers. That is That whole area of PCSD is very, very important to us. Our capacity has not um, developed those programs as deeply as we'd like to because we, are, we got targeted by the county where we live to be the center that is the clinical program for the the other, the youth, particularly sure. in the situations that I described. Mm-hmm. But, but my heart's desire is to be able to expand to both those adult groups because it's very impactful for people at any age to be able to heal from the inside out. And that's what the experiential work, the work with nature, the work with horses. Right. The work of incorporating all of those elements, movement and animals and food and music, to be able to do that in one setting. It takes very little talk. And I'm talking a lot, so you think maybe that's not the case. But, <laughs> but in these actual recovery sessions... Yeah. It's very, very little talk. That's great. You don't need to. Yeah. Now, uh, if we go back, I believe, uh, a year or two ago, there were uh, fires that were bearing down on your facility, and it seemed like you had a dome of protection. But if memory serves me correctly, uh, didn't you host um, a lot of the firefighters and they had to set up at your facility? That's exactly right. So we're in this in the center of the wine country of Northern California. And all around me are vineyards. And I am the one property that doesn't have acres and acres and acres of grapes. We do have olive trees and we do produce olive oil for the, for the charity as one of the ways that we raise money. But we have a lot of open space. I'm also, uh, I also have a, private FAA certified airport on the property. And so in this case of the, uh, we were actually the nuns fire. Um, If you saw any news that identified different fires, we were nuns fire. Um, It actually began in uh, right behind our property um, in a state park. We have 22,000 acres of uh, public park Uh, that run up the mountainside behind me. So since we have so much open space, Cal Fire set up their base camp here, and they use the airport. They can stage their large bulldozing equipment and uh, where many, many, many of the neighbors all around me burned. uh, My property was somewhat damaged, but not destroyed by any means that all my buildings in some form stayed intact. And so the first responders 
actually had base camp here, 37 porta potties, if you can imagine. <laughs> and so, and, and so they did uh, protect us. And, and I thanked them one day for, for keeping my property protected and, and safe. And they said, would you let your own home burn if you could help it? I mean, they were actually yeah. stationed here. Wow. So, they, so they were, they were, quite happy to be here and um uh we had them come after the fire and we had a, a gathering and they brought the fire trucks and and we spent time together and and it's real that's what really hit me how important this issue of post-traumatic shock really is and if we get really serious about it there's not a person on the planet that hasn't experienced forms of trauma and loss and pain or abuse or losing someone that they, they deeply love mm-hmm. and feeling that, that trauma gap. And so I think that this is something that we, as those who, who own and love horses, we understand how powerful that, nature and that connection to animals and particularly horses can be is something that we can share in a very simple way that has maybe a far greater reach than we might imagine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what have you experienced with, um, of course, we're talking about the, the animals helping people. Um, have you seen the the opposite happen where the horses have actually changed in a way because some of them may come from trauma situations themselves. Uh, Probably about half of our horses are severe trauma survivors themselves. One of my horses, uh, I flew him from Brazil and he was, he was a bullfighter and he was injured. And this particular horse is a, I would say that he probably had PCSD when he came to America. He was so sensitive that a feather would blow by and he'd shoot up like a rocket. And he began working in the trauma recovery work uh, probably about six years ago. And he has become so engaged with people and so interested in relationship and he still has the sensitivity, he still has the energy, he's still secreto, he's still very much the head of the herd, mm-hmm. but his tenderness and his gentleness, he can run an obstacle course and jump jumps and weave cones with a child at liberty because he chooses to be in relationship. What is so beautiful is we brought a Marion that that had suffered a uh, to one stillborn and then one miscarriage three months before delivery. She was probably in the eighth month when she lost the last full. They brought her here, and I have seen her. She was quite shut down and um, not really interested in people. Now I drive up, and she trots over to the edge of, of her paddock to the fence and greets me and <laughs> and. To see the way that she engages, she'll walk from her paddock into the stable, into her stall at Liberty. Now she just walks side by side. How they have come into enjoying that type of engagement. I truly feel that that humans and horses are learning and growing and healing together. Right. It's trust. It's feeling safe. It's having a job to do that they enjoy. I had a 38-year-old horse that was on equinity every single day that I had him um, who just passed away. He was a national champion polo player. He just passed away in July at age 38. Wow. His name is Bearcat. Um, He worked with the children in the charity the day before. He was completely engaged and loving and participated. And then the next day, he was not looking quite right. And I called the vet, and he said, Bearcat's ready to go. 
he's done. Yeah. And it was, it was so amazing because someone that knew him from the polo circuit came to visit, you know, like within the last year of Bearcat's life. And they said, we have never seen Bearcat so happy that the last five years have been the best years of his life being engaged in the charity work. He so loves his job. And I feel like keeping his health in balance and keeping his mind active and sharp allowed him to enjoy all the days of his 38 years until the end. Right. That's incredible. Just like humans, if our health is good and we've got relationships and we've got something to do that has purpose and meaning, then what more could we ask for? That's a fulfilling, rich life. That's right. That's right. Wow. Well, Dr. Sherlyn, I can't thank you enough for your time. This is probably, well, it is our longest podcast we've had. Um, it's packed full of information. And thank you so much for your expertise uh, from a scientific level and for sharing about your farm and your rehabilitation work. Um, that's absolutely fascinating. Um, if somebody wanted to look you up online, uh, where would be the best place uh, to find you? Our website is belloscavallos.org, B-E-L-O-S-C-A-V-A-L-O-S.org. Uh, the same on Instagram. You can get a beautiful look at what our, our farm is and what we do and how we engage um, from our Instagram, we are also on Facebook, bellos uh, org, org. Um, I would want to say a lot of, well, all of the children that we work with are at a high level of security. And so just so that you know, the children that you see on the website are other children that have come and done activities and engaged with the horses in similar things that the charity kids do, but it is unlawful for us to post any image. Some, some of these children have experienced sex trafficking and, and uh, abduction and some things. So just so that you know, we're not, not exposing the children that are actually uh, under security that are in the charity on the websites. Those children are doing uh, the same engagements with the horses, but we have permission from their parents. Right. Yeah. So some of the, the, the work that you're doing, high profile people that probably have may or may not have been on the news, things like this, um, that all of their. That's right. Right. Yeah. Well, that's. That's right. Or that they're at risk because they have escaped a terrible situation mm -hmm. and they need to, their whereabouts need to be protected. Sure. Well, I uh, I can't thank you enough for doing that kind of work. I know I've been out to your place. It's a beautiful place and uh, didn't get to spend enough time with my travels, but uh, I, I've got to come back out there and, and visit sometime. Um, but uh, thank You're always welcome. Well, thank you. I hope you do. I will definitely do that. And I want to thank anyone, everyone that listened, that I'm incredibly grateful that you took the time to, to hear my stories of the charity and also to learn more about Equinity because uh, John and the Equinity product are very, very important to me. And I appreciate you generously giving your time to listen and hope that it was useful to you. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Charlene from California, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the Equinity podcast. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's all for this episode of the Equinity Podcast. For more information on purchasing Equinity, be sure to visit our website at teamequinity.com, where you'll also find product information as well as more testimonials on how others have seen amazing results by implementing Equinity into their horse's supplement regime. We'll have more stories on how Equinity is helping horses worldwide right here on a future episode of the Equinity Podcast. 